two, one. Hello, it's Grant Cameron. This is another update. It's day six after the disclosure event that occurred by the US government last Saturday. Uh, it is a short update of material that has come in the last couple of days. Uh, and I'm calling it Bye Bye UFO Cover Up. It's game, set, and match. And I firmly believe that. I believe uh, that this thing is unraveling exactly the way I was told it was going to unravel a year ago. Government officials would come forward. They would identify who they were. And they would release the fact that this story is true. That is exactly what's happened. You've seen the first game piece played. This is this uh, film that has been brought out, has been released by the US government. And next you're going to see other film and you're going to see pieces of uh, uh, hardware uh, or whatever you want to call it, material. Um, and this thing is unraveling. And this is what I was told. I think I had this in the last update. Uh, this is only the thing to start it. Uh, it is about to pick up and it's going to get very, very active. You're going to see a lot of uh, disclosures coming. Now that the story has um, been released, a lot of the uh, skeptics are now coming forward to try to kill the story. And I've always said in the past that when this thing finally does break, it is not going to be religion that's going to suffer. It's not going to be media that's going to suffer. It's not going to be the government that's going to suffer. It is going to be the para the um, materialistic paradigm that is going to come crashing down and science is going to uh, take a big hit because a lot of uh, scientists are saying you can't get here from there this is impossible uh, they are the ones I've always said who are the ones who are holding up the cover-up people are embarrassed to talk about the UFO subject not because of the government or the media or even their relatives they're afraid to talk about the cover-up and the fact that there are uh, true UFOs that are here on this planet because they're afraid of the scientific community, that they will lose their grants, they will be ostracized, they will lose their jobs. And so I believe that is the, the group of people that are trying to um, make sure this story does not come out. And a lot of these people have now come forward. Um, the, the, uh, but first, um, T.D. Barnes, who people would expect to be a skeptic, uh, he's very famous for being the roadrunner guy at Area 51, uh, did an interview the other night with George Knapp on Coast to Coast, and um, he's always maintained that the Area 51 Bob Lazar story, uh, as far as he's concerned, is not true. Um, there's an S4, but it's not where they say it is, and really is does not believe the uh, UFO story at Area 51. But in the interview with uh, George Knapp, George asked him about his opinion about the uh, the Pentagon thing, and uh, what did he think about it? And this is what T.D. Barnes said: "I am very, very interested. I can't wait to talk to you." So here you have a guy who should be a skeptic, who has played these. Uh, the idea that he doesn't really believe the Area 51 story with UFOs and has been very impressed with what's happened and it has, has probably by now had an off-record meeting with George Knapp and George Knapp is cluing him in as to what he knows about this story. Uh, but the, the, the Seth Sostak, who's the head of SETI, um, has now come forward and um, attacked the story, which would be expected because um, if this story is true, and if there are some sort of intelligence here from wherever they're from and the U.S. government knows it and they have been studying it, um, who needs a silly effort to investigate? Uh, these people's budgets are gone. They will be looking for jobs. Who needs people looking at other planets when they are right here among us? So Seth Shostak has come forward and basically what he said uh, to put the story down, if you see something in the air that you don't understand and you're the guy in charge of the Air Force, you want to know what it is. It doesn't have much to do with aliens necessarily. And so that was one of the things he said. And then he made the argument about the space is too big. You can't get there from here. It's a standard materialistic argument that you can't get here. And then, of course, he adds on, well, they're running around. If they are here, they're not doing anything. And that doesn't make any sense. So he's come forward, but it, it makes sense because his job is on the line. If this story is true, 
um, these guys are going to lose their funding. The other one that came forward, and this one shocked a lot of UFO people, they were very upset about this, is Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is supposed to be uh, objective about uh, science and about uh, astrophysics and stuff like that. And he came forward and he basically said a bunch of stupid things and probably the stupidest thing was, call me when you have a dinner invite from an alien. And so these guys have come forward and attacked. And I'll give one more attack that takes place later on and explain um, what that's all about. Uh, a lot of people are still linking this story into Tom DeLonge. And as I pointed out at the beginning of this broadcast, what I was told was not Tom DeLonge would come forward. And I was told that government officials would identify themselves. And this was a year ago I heard this. Government officials will identify themselves and they will expose the story. They will say the story is true. A lot of people are still linking it into the Tom DeLong uh, uh, platform and the company that he's formed. And Tom DeLong does play an important role in this whole thing is he set up a platform where these guys could do this gradual disclosure, where they could unveil this thing. And they're doing it through Tom DeLong. So Tom DeLong did set up a platform that gave them the opportunity to roll this thing out. But what you have to remember is Tom DeLong has only been in this game since 2015. It was at that moment when he made his first contact and was invited to uh, a meeting with Lockheed Skunk Works. Then Lockheed Skunk Works sent him to the CIA. The CIA sent him to NASA. NASA sent him to the West Coast to a bunch of generals. And they basically set up this team that, that, that offered to help Tom DeLong and they're operating through him. The key to this story that um, has unveiled on Saturday that a lot of people I think maybe have missed is the fact that this story actually goes back to 2007. It goes long before Tom DeLong ever got into this game. It goes back to 2007, involves uh, uh, four uh, senators, uh, three of them uh, Democrats, and Ted Stevens, a um, Republican from Alaska who had his UFO sighting, all get together and they provide funding, black budget funding, for an investigation into UFOs. So this started a long, long time ago. And uh, a couple of key points have come forward now to indicate that uh, some people knew about this thing. Um, and I had gotten some warnings before um, that this, this was unraveling. But if we go to um, what Tom DeLong said just after the news conference in October, he said every word has been planned for months. The biggest stuff has yet to come. Anybody complaining has no clue what's going on at the DOD. The important part of this, this uh, message that Tom put out uh, as the news conference takes place is every word spoken has been planned for months. And that's the most important thing I've got to point out to people is that I knew this. This is very carefully orchestrated. They, I was told clearly not only do they know what they're going to do, they have deadlines, they know exactly how they're going to roll this thing out. This is not something they're experimenting, they're trying. This is what I was told a long time ago. And that's what Tom says. Every word has been written. So all these guys are reading off teleprompters on October the 11th. Uh, uh, Elizondo has just quit days before he appears. His speech is already written for him. And Tom DeLong actually has contacts with Elizondo before this, this news conference actually takes place. He's dealing with him long before he actually retires. Uh, so um, here's the story, and this is where it's now sort of changed, and I want to sort of clarify uh, this part of the story, is the story is now turned into a story about Lou Elizondo. That Lou Elizondo was friends with the Secretary of Defense, uh, that Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, actually saved his life in Afghanistan. So he's been very close friends with Mattis. And the story that's uh, being put out now was that Lou Elizondo got frustrated with uh, working in this program for 10 years. And he put in a resignation letter to Mattis and said, I'm frustrated and I'm leaving. And he uh, resigned from the, his job at the Department of Defense. The next day, he joins up with Tom DeLong. His speech is written for him, and he comes out. And what I want to point out is that's not the, really the way these kind of things happen. We want to now sort of give him the Medal of Freedom for his effort to do this, and he did make an effort. But what I'm saying is the same old thing. And I've said it in my Managing Magic book that 
most of these people are puppets. This is all puppet. This is all orchestrated. That's my belief. I may be wrong, but I simply believe this is true. And that is because when Lou Elizondo leaves the Department of Defense, they do not give him the film as a goodbye present. You've got to explain where does the film come from. Lou Elizondo can quit and get frustrated. He's under a security clearance. He is is uh, he's torn, taken an oath to uh, keep secret. This was black budget money, and so when he comes out, he can come out and talk. The key is that a bunch of video came with it. So this is orchestrated. Uh, this is not something that you just sort of drop. Um, here's the one of the reporters for the New York Times, and what she said. And she's the one that first uh, met with Lou Elizondo in a hotel in New York City. She spent, she said, we spent uh, hours with him reviewing unclassified documents for the $22 million program operated largely in the white. That is not under uh, special restricted access, but hidden in the huge defense budget, only with parts of it classified. So a lot of this was um, um, unclassified stuff but it still is secret and it's uh, gone to a contractor and the contractor is Bob Bigelow. Uh, this is what I point out when it comes to all this material that's coming out, people are forgetting that the material that's coming out, whether it's um, the film or whether it's uh, this hardware stuff, that the, the, this material that they apparently are, are, are ready to show or whether it's the plans that are being brought by Steve Justice, this is all under security. This has all been uh, very highly classified since day one. This is the top secret memo I always refer to, written November 1950 by Wilbur Smith in Canada, who went down to the United States. And he writes in this top secret memo, I made discreet inquiries through the Canadian Embassy staff in Washington who were able to obtain for me the following information, the matter, Blank Saucers is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rated higher even than the H-bomb. And so I always say, when you see a leak inside the government, I'm saying there's a good 95% chance this is the government leaking it for whatever reason. You, if it's the most highly classified secret, you do not have people walking out with secrets to tell and videos and plans from Lockheed Skunk Works. Uh, here's um, a, a letter, and this is one of the things I'm going to be releasing. I have all the correspondence from uh, Barry Goldwater, who was the uh, chairman of the Intelligence Committee for the Senate. This is a letter he wrote to uh, Lee Graham uh, in 1981. He was, as you can see on the top, he was actually the intelligence chairman at the time. And he, this is where the famous above top secret comes. And he's basically telling Lee Graham, Lee Graham asked him the question about him going to the Blue Room, that he went to his friend Curtis LeMay. And Curtis LeMay was in charge of the Blue Room at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And LeMay went to him and asked for access to the Blue Room where they keep the hardware and the material. And so I'll read the letter. He says, Dear Mr. Graham, first let me tell you that I have, a long, I have long ago given up acquiring access to the so-called Blue Room at Wright-Patterson, as I have had a long string of denials from chief after chief, as so I have given up. Um, the answer to your question, one, is essentially correct. I nor am I aware of its contents, and I am not aware of anything having been relocated. The last paragraph is the most important one. He says, to tell you the truth, Mr. Graham, this thing has gotten so highly classified, even though I will admit there was a least, it is just impossible to get anything on it. And this is where he basically um, started to talk about the fact that it was above top secret, that this, this material, he could not get to it. Um, and so basically when the government is releasing film, when they're releasing all this kind of stuff, this is orchestrated. They need permission to release this kind of stuff. Somebody is signing off on the material that they're releasing. So again, the same thing with um, uh, Steve Justice from Skunk Works. He comes out and when you leave Skunk Works, they don't give you the plans for the UFO stuff. Uh, to go and put into a public corporation. So uh, I would say that anything that's coming from from there has some sort of approval from the government and the rest of it's all cover story as to why they're releasing it, how they quit, all this kind of stuff. I'm very suspicious of this kind of stuff. I just look at the fact that 
supposedly classified material is now being leaked into the, the UFO community, into the public. And there has to be someone signing off. And as I said at the beginning, and I've said it a couple times in this presentation already, I was told a year ago that this would happen. They would drop this stuff into the public. And I heard that a year ago. The key guy behind this story is uh, um, Bigelow. Bob Bigelow, billionaire aerospace executive in Las Vegas. Uh, he is the key to understanding this story. It starts in 2007, and it starts with these four congressmen or senators who uh, put it up for contract, and Bob Bigelow wins the contract. Bob Bigelow has been very interested. Bob Bigelow actually ran the, uh, the Institute for Discovery Science, and this was a group uh, where he's been very interested his whole life in this subject. And he brought in the top people. And these are these Avery type people. A lot of them appeared. Some of the same people that are working for Tom DeLong now. Uh, Kit Green, um, uh, John Alexander, although John isn't really any more connected to Tom DeLong, uh, but Hal Putoff, um, Jacques Vallée, all these people who you hear their names circling, circulating around now with the Tom DeLong thing. He would bring these people in and uh, pay them as advisors. And he was trying to get to the bottom of it. So he ma it made total sense that he would bring these people in, the top experts in the UFO field, who have had some contact and some insight, and bring them into a panel to pick their brain and to figure out what's going on. So he has, for a long time, used his resources and his money to try to figure out the UFO um, mystery. What most people don't realize is that he put up millions of dollars, not just for UFOs, but he put up millions of dollars for a chair in consciousness studies at UNLV in Las Vegas. And this is important because I've said, and a number of other people have said, it's getting more popular as we go along, that the, the, the key part to this whole UFO thing to understand it is to understand consciousness. For example, the guy that runs the Tom DeLong operation said, the idea that you can measure this, that there's going to have some physical thing where you can measure and analyze and stuff. The idea that you can measure this is laughable. How do you define something where there does not appear to be any there, there? This has got to do with consciousness. This has got to do with multidimensionality, which is beyond the capability of our present science. And Bob Bigelow put up millions of dollars for consciousness studies at UNLV. So he knows the connection. He knows the connection with, with consciousness. He knows it's an important component of the whole thing. One of the key guys in this whole story is uh, George Knapp, and George Knapp is, uh, because he's in Las Vegas, he knows Bob Bigelow very well, he's done a number of interviews with Bob Bigelow, he's friends with Bob Bigelow, and, and he did an, an interview on Sunday night, the story broke on Saturday, Sunday night George did his Coast to Coast, and we are actually going to put the transcript, I think it's so important what George said uh, in, on Sunday night, we're going to put the transcript up at my... Um, publishing company in the news section. We're going to put the transcript of what he said. I'm going to give you a little hint, a uh, little synopsis of what he said. But George has known about this whole story since 2007. And he actually put a, um, a message out on Facebook a number of weeks ago that actually hinted to people that this was, this was going to be the key to the story. And he said nobody picked up on it. Here's what he wrote. In news, all roads lead to Las Vegas. Every big news story, no matter what it is or where it breaks, has at least one legit Las Vegas connection or angle. And sometimes a big story will have more than one Las Vegas link. link. Just saying. So he basically hints that this story is going to break out of Las Vegas. And that is the key to the story. To understand this story, you have to realize the importance and the role of Bob Bigelow in this story. And so on Sunday night, this is the way he sort of um, talked about the stuff he's heard. Holy moly, I'm not going to get into it. He's had a number of meetings. He's known, uh, he's known since 2007. Uh, he was sort of sworn to secrecy. He, does, he knows just bits and pieces of the story, but he knew that this thing had been set up. He knew that they were, they were operating. And so he said he was a fly on the wall. And from time to time, he would get indications of the stuff they had and what they were going to do. So he's been in this game for the, for the 10 years that this thing has operated. So whatever George Knapp says about this story uh, is very important. And that's why we're going to put the transcript up. He's doing another interview as, as this thing is being released. He's doing another interview 
and he probably will release some more material. And if you go to his uh, new station at KLS TV, he's doing a story almost every night on this. He's going to uh, put out stories and reveal what he knows about this, this kind of story. But George Knapp is probably the main guy to be listening to when it comes to understanding what this story is all about. Uh, Lorian Fenton told me at an interview with her, she's known since 2012. Um, I've, I've had indications, I didn't know very much, but I had indications uh, that something was going on a couple of years back. Uh, what George importantly points out on Sunday night, this is some of the big things that he pointed out. In the New York Times report, they talked about a 490 page report that was done by um, Bigelow's um, aerospace uh, division that ran this this um, a contract for the for the U.S. government, and what he points out is there is not one 490-page report. There are 38 reports that he knows of, and many of them are hundreds of pages long. George Knapp says there are mountains of material. This is not one little video they're releasing. This is not one little tiny report that they may have because a lot of people, that's the way they're saying it. That's all they got. One little fuzzy video of a, of a fighter jet filming this thing. Believe you me, there's lots of stuff coming. As George says, there's mountains of evidence that they, that they have accumulated over the 10 years. 38 reports. 46 private rep before 2012 this is my understanding before 2012 when they had the money um, Bob Bigelow had 46 private um, full-time investigators working on the program and these were a quick uh, alert teams who could be on the site I remember working with Angela Joyner on one particular case where Bob Bigelow's people went into Oregon so I I knew that the, they had these teams and they were very professional they were all um, you know former intelligence or uh, um, military or um, you know with police backgrounds they were carefully picked people and I had one case where I saw how they they operated and so 46 private investigators who were gathering material at least until 2012 and um, and then he says and this will be up to him to describe he said there was some tie into the Skinwalker Ranch in in the material that was done and uh, so he's going to release some of this material and this uh, was released in one of the, the reports that he did with um, um, Senator Reid, uh, who talks about the fact that Bigelow had the lowest cost, that this thing was actually put out for contract, this uh, thing to investigate the UFO. And Bigelow came in with the lowest cost, and he actually built some of his own infrastructure, that he actually put some of his own money into this thing to try to figure out what was going on here and that he was very interested in the subject but of course we all knew that uh, and so basically what has happened is bob has um basically got the story it's almost like the story of con uh, contact where you have this very rich guy working in the background who has all the answers who has all the the story and basically uh it appears now that bob bigelow all the material that that is out there uh, bob bigelow now has uh, basically control of this and we'll see how he unravels this. Um, he's had a, a number of initiatives that he's done through the years. When you start to put the dots together, you see that, that he's been very active in this field. Um, we already knew that um, his Bigelow Aerospace Advanced uh, Space Studies was getting all the reports from the Federal Aviation Administration from pilots. That was already going into his, um, he had made the arrangement to get that, so he was getting all that material. This is when I um, realized Bob, but Bob has always gathered up this material. I figured he was just gathering it up because he was this rich guy who could afford to gather all of this material. This is Major um, Coleman von Kavitsky, who was a Hungarian guy who worked at the UN. He was an official at the UN. And um, he, I was interested in him because he was interacting with a number of presidents. He was like a Stephen Greer type guy who would encounter every president and try to get them to disclose and send letters to the president. And he had all sorts of attachments of various documents and things that he would send to various presidents. So I would see this stuff at various presidential archives, all his writings, all his letters. And I was gathering all these together and he had died. And so I went looking for the his files and uh, Antonio Huneas who was very good friends of him in New York I asked him and he said well they went to Bob Bigelow Bob Bigelow bought the files so I said oh okay and he said um, 
I, I help pack the files. So I went to somebody, and this is when NIDS was running, I went to NIDS and I asked for the files. And I was told, okay, and then I came back, reply and said, they aren't in the office. And I said, well, he, he probably doesn't have them. And I said, he's got them. Antonio Honeas told me he packed the files with the wife. And I know he bought the files. And so then he came back and he said, well, they're not here. Maybe he's got them in private. So this was in this 10 year period. And so he was basically gathering up material and he had gotten von Kibitzky's files. Uh, the Carpenter affair, this was, uh, it was kind of a scandalous thing. Uh, Bob Bigelow for $14,000 bought up a lot of abduction files from um, the Carpenter, who was a, a, a regressionist who was working with abductees, and he's I think it was 100, 140 clients. And uh, Bob's NIDS group bought up these files for fourteen thousand dollars. And because of the confidential and touchy nature of abduction research and regression, uh, there was a big scandal about the fact that he had sold these files to Bigelow. So he's gathering up these files. And the, the, I, I know that he had talked to somebody in Canada about getting the, the Canadian uh, files. I don't know what happened there. Uh, but the, the real big one was everybody knows that Bob Bigelow put up a bunch of money for MUFON to get these quick teams to go in and investigate files and stuff like that. And I knew at the time Bob Bigelow had stated it was not his money. And I was at that time asking questions, trying to find out, well, who put up the money for that that had been given to MUFON. Now, the whole thing fell apart, and he went to these 46 investigators rather than MUFON. Um, but MUFON, uh, James Carrion was the guy who actually um, was running the deal at the time, and he was fighting this. And I'll read what he actually wrote at the time. What I see in the MUFON Bass, and that's uh, Bigelow's, Bigelow's organization, relationship is active management of MUFON's work, despite assurances from Bass otherwise, by carefully controlling the purse strings with each contract evaluation period. They are ensuring they receive a constant flow of information from MUFON, uh, while also making sure that MUFON does not end up with the operational funding to stabilize its long-term financial well-being. Who's on the receiving end of this information? And this is the question. So at the time they were asking, where is this information going? Uh, then he said, since uh, that I have uh, not been able to, since that will not be disclosed to MUFON, I cannot state for sure, but I don't feel confident that the information is being used for what MUFON was originally informed. I can only conclude that Bass, which is ba Bigelow, is at somebody else's beck and call. The board does not need to agree with me on this, which is why I'm leaving the contract renewal response to the board, James Carrion. And now we know probably for sure that, that Bob was gathering up these, these material because he was part of this operation set up by uh, these senators to gather material and he was doing this UFO investigation. And that was sort of substantiated uh, uh, Alejandro Rojas was on with George Knapp on Sunday night, and he talked about this as well, that all the people at MUFON at the time uh, were uh, forced to uh, sign non-disclosure agreements. And he, his quote was, some of the guys who did sign it, Antonio, uh, Alejandro didn't want to um, sign it, but some of the people, guys who did sign it, he said, said they, uh, you'd be fascinated if you knew who was really funding all this so he said now he, the things had come together that this this uh, material was being used for this um, black budget uh, investigation of UFOs and now we go to the portal story this is sort of an update uh, one of the people who has attacked this story uh, is um, uh, Dr. Ron Pandolfi um, who I say this is an important one of the other disclosures is one of the number of disclosures and this is one of the disclosure stories that coming out and I've been up and down on this story but I worked on it for uh, at least a year as well and it was unraveling at the same time because this part of the story that I was told was that there were a number of teams that the DeLong operation was only a, one of a number of disclosure initiatives that were going on and this portal story was another one of the initiatives so um, it, what, what's basically come down to is I've gone up and down on this story and now we have a situation where um, the, the, the long 
operation. Everybody for a year, I heard this whole thing and George Knapp talks about the same thing. People said, this is garbage. This guy's crazy. Uh, this is a big scam. He's just raising money. And it's like on and on and on and on. And this was even one of the comments that was made about uh, Tom DeLonge saying he's going to bring out stuff. This is the countdown to announce another countdown of a coming countdown for another countdown we're really waiting for, but that countdown hasn't started until this countdown finishes before the other one. And it was this thing that the thing kept getting kicked down the road as the same as the portal story keeps getting kicked down the road. And the point I want to make is everybody says, ah, this is all garbage. It's the long, it's all scam. There's nothing's going to happen and all this sort of stuff. And then suddenly everything happens. And suddenly it's like, oh, he's the Messiah. He's walking on water. Tom's the greatest. And suddenly everybody switches horses and they think he's the, the greatest that this actually happened. And so I would say this with the portal story, because I've gone from 90% belief down to 10% belief only a little while ago. And now I'm back up near 90% belief and I'm waiting for this thing to unfold. And it's almost like Tom DeLong, where Tom DeLong at the very end, even he had questions whether this thing was going to unravel. And this is why I'm saying that this is not a Tom DeLong story. This is a Tom DeLong building a base where these guys inside the government can operate from and use Tom DeLong to bring this material out. And at the very end, only days before that disclosure last Saturday, Tom DeLong wrote this something's coming. And every day they tell me, one more day. Ugh. But I will look back on it as one of my of life's greatest accomplishments. So even at the end, he was doubting that it was actually going to happen because they kept kicking it down the road. And there was a lot of delays to the New York Times story about it coming out. So the, the same thing's happening with the Portal story. It's, it's Ron Pandolfi and his uh, wife who are in the key to this thing. And I've watched this. I have a number of people uh, that I, I listen to. I listen to everything because this is critically, this has got to do with the consciousness. This has got to do with Bob Bigelow putting up the money for the consciousness study. This is uh, Jim Semivan saying, this is going to deal with consciousness. This has to do with my 200, 2012 download. That has to do with consciousness. This has Tom DeLong at Lockheed Skunk Works saying when he brought up consciousness with the head scientist, the head scientist, that's all he wanted to talk about. Consciousness is a critically important story, and that's why the portal story, which is unraveling at the same time, is also a very important story because it actually goes into the thing of how they get here, other worlds, moving from this world to another multidimensional, inter, you know, whatever you want to call it, interdimensional, uh, the consciousness aspect that it's not, you know, spaceships flying at the speed of light travel traversing the, the universe. This has got to do with, uh, you know, almost entangled particles, this sort of thing, or what Ben Rich said when Ben Rich, the head of Lockheed Skunk Works, was asked, Ben, how do they get here? And his answer was, What do you know about ESP? So the New York Times, and this is where, where for whatever reason, was trying to, still trying to figure this out, um, Ron Pandolfi. Um, as attacks the story immediately. As soon as it comes out, I contact Dan Smith, who's sort of like his spokesman, and they talk about fake news, and um, this is a big scam run by Hal Putoff, and then this thing appears, this is only about two days ago, Julian Assange posts this thing. The New York Times fake news apocalypse has reached perfection with a front page story claiming UFOs exist. No surprise to see the CIA parapsychology, Scientology frauds like Harold Putoff involved and the most basic journalist questions unasked. And so basically Harold Putoff had in his early days a relationship to Scientology. So they're throwing the Scientology thing in his face. And uh, basically this is posted by Julian Assange, but Dan Smith, who is the uh, sort of, leaks a lot of Ron Pandolfi's material, uh, actually is claiming that Ron actually wrote this. And Ron sent it to Julian Assange, and Julian Assange puts it up. So the question is, we're trying to figure out now, is why is Ron trying to put this story down when he's trying to put his own um, uh, story out as well? And it may be plausible deniability. And so what I, what's happened in the UFO community now is a lot of people are attacking Ron and saying this is total garbage. It's, it's almost running the same course as the Tom DeLong thing. He's total, totally full of it. He's scamming. It's disinformation. He's throwing us off the, off the thing. Even this 
poem that he put up the other just two days ago and he talks about is a poem he writes to his to his wife and together we will travel uh throughout your new worlds so he's always talking about this thing going from this world into another world and it's got to do with this portal uh like a wishing well you can manifest on the other side all this kind of stuff and people are now uh busy attacking ron pandolfi and i've watched them and i've been up and down them as well i would just warn people as with tom DeLong, don't paint yourself into a corner because i've seen a lot of stuff and i'm to a point where when i can confirm that this is a real story uh, i will say this is a real story that this may be one of the other things that is about to be dropped on the public is this idea of these interdimensional portals finally i'll go to um this whole thing has created a, a fuss inside the White House. And uh, uh, Sarah um, Sanders uh, was asked at the uh, White House press uh, briefing yesterday um, about the, the disclosure event on Saturday. I always say this is the most important event um, that can possibly happen because whether you got Secretary of Defense or whether it's Elizondo or whether it's Tom DeLong or me or whatever, nobody really has the proper need to know. When you have the president, you have the person who is the guy who has, has the need to know. And I always say, if you ever get a chance to ask the president uh, or a, a question, don't ask him whether he's seen a UFO or believes in UFOs. You ask him whether he's been briefed. Uh, because the president, uh, I do believe, is briefed on the subject. He is the wizard behind the curtain. He's running the cover up. And so the question coming into the White House of does Donald Trump believe in UFOs or is he briefed is a very important question to put the president uh, sort of on the hot seat to answer the question because he's the guy who will ultimately have the answer. And um, so the question this time was asked uh, by um, uh, Jordan Fabian. And what he asked Sanders uh, is, what about the president's belief in extraterrestrial life? And is he going to refund the program that was shut down in 2012? And uh, the, the press secretary says, uh, it's something that she hasn't talked with the president about, but I'll check in with that and be happy to circle back. Now, as of today, I have not heard today. Uh, it does not appear that she has come back with an answer to the, to the, the press people. Uh, but again, this is the significant thing that is going to change it, is if we can get the president to actually confirm or deny that this is a government operation, because when the president actually uh, identifies the fact that this is real and gives sanction to the, all this, these leaks that are happening, uh, basically uh, then it, it'll really start to move. So these are the, the four reporters. And what you have to remember is that um, a question in the White House press room on UFOs just doesn't happen. There was one in January of 1954. There was one in 1997. Uh, and then three of them were asked when Hillary Clinton was talking about disclosing the New York Times, which started this firestorm, started a firestorm in May of 2016. On May the 10th, they put out a UFO article about Hillary Clinton disclosing. And at that point, three reporters, you have Andrea Mitchell up on the top left. You have Mark uh, uh, Noller up in the uh, right. And you have April Ryan down on the bottom left who asked the question about Roswald. And these three reporters started to ask Ask questions of Obama's press secretary and Obama's press secretary said I don't have a tab in my book on that I don't have a need to know but it you should ask the president uh, he claims jokingly that his job gives him access to that type of material it'll be interesting ask the president but nobody ever did these three reporters uh, I contacted them indirectly and said ask the question and they never did now we have this uh, reporter from the hill who is now asking questions and we will see where it goes. But we have the release of the film, uh, and George Knapp is talking about the hardware. Uh, Bob Bigelow has a, uh, not just a, like a room, they're talking about a building, which means they've got more than one little piece of, of hardware. And George, uh, when we release the transcript, you'll see George hints at this thing, uh, that it's uh, very lightweight, it's very uh, resilient, and um, the, the fact that they've, they've, they've got this material. And the key is that the guy who has the material is the government contractor, who is Bob Bigelow. You see him as an aerospace guy. You got to see him now as the government employee who runs the government operation for UFOs. He's the, the government contractor who has the security clearances, who's been hired by the U.S. government. And I see him as a government employee. 
So we'll see where it goes. Uh, we'll do another update maybe next week uh, as this thing unfolds. And I want to thank you for listening.